Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alan Ho, Markham City Councillor. As Chair of the Economic Growth, Culture and Entrepreneurship Committee at the City of Markham, I would like to welcome you all to Section 3 of the International Online Summit. Becoming Public Art. This exciting live event is presented by the City of Markham in partnership with Art and Public Unlimited. I would like to open the proceedings with a land acknowledgement. We begin today by acknowledging that we walk upon the traditional territories of indigenous peoples and we recognize their history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land. We are grateful to all indigenous groups for their commitment to protect the land and its resources. And we're committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. We have some very significant speakers today from environments, from Calgary to New York City. I look forward very much to hearing what they have to say on the civic role of the artists and how some of their ideas may apply to the fast growing city of Markham. Now, I would like to turn over the floor to the two co-curators. Let's welcome Markham's Yan Wu and Rebecca Carbin of Art and Public Unlimited. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Councillor Ho, for the welcoming notes. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, my name is Yan Wu, Public Art Curator for the City of Markham. And uh, thank you all for joining us today, especially everyone returning from previous sessions. Um, we are so thrilled to see that so many participants have already pre-registered for the whole summit. Hope you like the program we put together and uh, that we will see you again in the coming weeks. The idea of organizing this summit directly arises from the Markham Public Art Master Plan 2020 to 2024. If you wish to learn more about it, the document can be found at the summit website along with an in-depth interview with the leading consultant for the project, Helena Gadogonic. The link is in the chat box. When we were about to bring the plan forward to the city council for approval, we tried to strategize on how to raise awareness about the potential impact of the plan. And more importantly, figuring out the best practices to implement it. What are the models and how to move forward, especially for an emerging public art program like ours, still in the process of developing infrastructures and procedures. We thought, why not create an occasion to gather all the great working models in one place and study them together? Moreover, we want to hear everyone's voice along the production line, from artist to curator, planner to architect, designer to fabricator, curator to administrator, conservator to, conservator to spectators. Public art making is a collective effort that demands highly complex processes and negotiations. In last week's session, we heard behind the scenes stories told by the makers, artist, architect, and a fabricator. In today's session, we will hear insights shared by the host institutions and the commission agents. What are the possibilities inside a bureaucratic machine? So when the council approved our plan, we brought public art consultant Rebecca Carbing on board to design a summit together with us. It has been an absolute wonderful experience Thank you, Rebecca, for your knowledge, insight, and passion, and above all, your firm belief in public art. Originally, the summit was supposed to be a three-day in-person event back in June. Because of the COVID, we changed it to today's format. We were a bit disappointed at the beginning, but now we're thrilled that we're able to reach a global community. My sincere gratitude to those who have reached out with encouraging notes and feedback. Looking forward to more exchanges and discussions in the coming weeks. 
Before hand it over to Rebecca to introduce today's session, I would like to say a few thank yous. Thanks to everyone at the City of Markham for making this summit happen, the amazing team at the Varley Art Gallery, and the great support from the team at Corporate Communication IT. And most importantly, just like without artists, there wouldn't be any public art. I would like to thank all the pre uh, presenters of the summit. Without you making your project happen and sharing them and your insights with us, that wouldn't be our Becoming Public Art Summit. Thank you. And now over to my collaborator, Rebecca Carbon. Thanks, Jan. And it has also been such a pleasure to collaborate with you on pulling this program together in the various forms it has taken over the past year. We've had some wonderful conversations um, as we hash out what this program is and needs to be in an ever-shifting context. Uh, so thanks for working uh, together with me on that. And thanks everyone for joining us today from wherever you are. We are thrilled to be sharing today's program with you. Joining us today are Shirley Levy speaking about New York City's uh, Public Artist in Residence program and Carolyn Bowen speaking about Cal Calgary's Watershed Plus, which was an artist, artist in residence program uh, within Calgary's Utilities and Environmental Protection Department. Artists think differently, and while most professions involved in city building are solutions-focused professions, art is not so much about providing answers as it is about asking questions. And both of these programs presented in A Civic Role for Artists are case studies in what happens when room is made within city building conventions for the albeit messy, uh, sometimes messy magic that happens when we welcome the creativity and unconventional approaches of artists. So a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce our moderator for this session. After the moderated conversation between the panelists, we'll have a Q&A from the audience. So please use the question and answer box, which is on the bottom of your screen, um, sort of at the far right of the group of icons at the bottom of your screen, uh, to input your questions. And Jan and I will uh, sort of triage these questions and co-facilitate feeding these to Michelle uh, once we open the floor for questions from the audience. But you can send your questions throughout uh, the discussion. Our session today is the third in our nine week summit program and we're really excited about the lineup, the rest of the lineup that we have. So please do join us for all of the, or some of the following sessions, same time and place, which is 1.30 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, where we cover a range of topics relevant to contemporary public art practices from a range of perspectives, all built on the premise of examining uh, through case studies and working models. So over the next six weeks after this session, we will cover art and urban planning, accessibility, placemaking, site specificity, temporary programming, and digital public art commissioning. And uh, once I've finished talking and handed over the mic, I will paste the registration link in the chat uh, for you to be able to sign up for future sessions. So without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce filmmaker, artist, and Toronto's photo laureate, Michelle Pearson Clark. Michelle Pearson Clark is a Trinidad born artist, writer, and educator who works in photography, film, video, and installation. Michelle was awarded the Toronto Friend of the Visual Arts 2019 Finalist Artist Prize, and she was a nominee for the 2019 Paul de Hook and Norman Walford Career Achievement Award, which is, makes me very excited about what she has coming ahead because uh, I think there's a lot of work uh, still to go in Michelle's career. Very recently, in addition of her incredible video installation, Suck Teeth Compositions, after Rashad Newsom has been, was acquired by the National Gallery of Canada, and she's currently the inaugural 2020 to 2021 artist in residence at the University of Toronto's Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies and the photo laureate for the city of Toronto. And as part of her photo laureate role, she sits on the mayor's external advisory committee for Artworks TO, Toronto's year of public art 2021, which will kick off the city's new 10 year public art strategy. And as strategy and programs lead for Artworks TO, it has been uh, an honor to work with Michelle in this capacity over the past number of months. So I would like to hand the mic over now to Michelle Pearson Clark. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for that warm welcome, Rebecca. Um, uh, yeah, I'm really, really interested in uh, hearing from our presenters today. As somebody who has been navigating for the first time in my practice, I've been in the role of photo laureate for about a year and a half now. Um, and it's the first time that I'm in any kind of official uh, artist civic role. And uh, it's been a journey sort of navigating that and, and figuring that out and what the parameters are and what I'm able to do. Um, so the artist in residence model um, that we're going to hear about today is, is something that I've uh, long known about and long been interested in. And so I'm really pleased to be able to be a part of this conversation. Um, 
just not gonna confirm we had some technical issues um but i think is carolyn going first yeah no is shirley going first shirley going first and okay, uh, carolyn is back with that and i think we're good now <laughs> okay great so uh, yeah, so our first presentation is about New York uh, City's Public Artists in Residence program, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce Shirley Levy. Um, as Chief of Staff for the NYC Department of Cultural Affairs, Shirley is part of the small executive team that manages the largest municipal funder for arts and culture in the U.S. Working closely with the Commissioner, she helps shape policy and directs projects that expand opportunities and resources for cultural organizations and artists. Since joining the agency in 2012, Shirley co-created and directs the New York City Public Artists in Residence Program. She leads AREA, the city's affordable real estate for artists initiative, uh, founded in 2016. She created the Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact in 2017. She launched a pilot program, City Canvas, to permit temporary art on construction sheds and fencing in 2019. And more recently, she is refocusing the agency's technical assistance and community engagement programs in response to COVID-19. Shirley holds a master's degree in arts administration from Teachers College, Columbia University, and a bachelor's degree in art history from Brandeis University. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I feel very honored to be here. Um, so, um, as I was just introduced, I'm the Chief of Staff uh, for the Department of Cultural Affairs in New York City. And Chief of Staff means different things to different people at different times. Um, sometimes I'm helping draft policy, sometimes I'm representing our commissioner at a task force on economic development, sometimes I'm helping uh, staff, you know, uh, work through a management problem, and sometimes I'm developing uh, and directing programs. And so I'm here to, uh, today to talk with you about one of my most beloved um, Pride and Joys, uh, which is the Public Artists in Residence Program uh, at DCLA, which is our, my agency, which I co-created with uh, a previous colleague in 2015. Um, and it has grown uh, into something kind of wild and amazing. Uh, we still call it a pilot in a lot of ways because we have a lot to learn from each iteration. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk with you today about is really the nuts and bolts of the program, kind of how it came to be um, what are some of the considerations and requirements that have to go into making it a success? Um, I'll pepper my conversation or my presentation with some examples of past projects, and I will try to speak quickly so that I don't run out of time, but I welcome all of your questions and I'm happy to, um, to engage in a dialogue with everyone after. Um, so let me share my screen and I'll go right into the presentation. Hopefully this works on the first go round. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen because I can. Let me just see how I, okay. So very quickly, uh, sort of a quick and dirty overview of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We are the largest municipal funder for arts and culture in the US, second, uh, you know, be second to the federal government. Um, our federal government provides about $1.3 billion in funds to, uh, to arts and culture, and that's from grants through the National Endowment for the Arts. It also covers the chain of Smithsonian institutions and libraries. Um, so then to put that in context, we have about $190 million that we provide to our sector um, through grants and operating subsidies. We also provide an additional $200 million in capital funding um, to you know, anything from equipment, you know, sound and lighting grids, to um, you know, whole, wholesale uh, renovations or constructions of new museums. Um, after us comes uh, the city of California, uh, sorry, the city of Los Angeles with $100 million. Um, and after that is Chicago at 35 million and so on and so on. So we're really in this unique position where we're a huge funder for a huge city. Um, but even still, our budget actually doesn't cover the breadth of what the city invests in arts and culture. If you think about the Department of Education, for example, we always say that the arts education budget in our city's Department of Education is actually larger than our entire cultural budget for our agency. So funding for arts and culture comes at our sector from lots of different places. Um, but our agency is really tasked with the capital portfolio and with grant making to our nonprofits. We do that through a number of ways. We have a unique public private partnership with a group of 34 institutions called the CIG, the Cultural Institutions Group. Um, those are organizations like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Natural History. It also includes the botanicals um, and other living collections like the zoos and uh, 
and the aquarium. Um, and for them, we pay their, some of their operating subsidy and um, some general operating support. We're also the landlord of their buildings. We have a very robust grant making program called the Cultural Development Fund, where we support over a thousand organizations uh, with a range of grants from uh, supporting general operating to uh, programs specifically designed to improve language access um, and advance work in disability access and inclusion. As I mentioned, we have our capital portfolio. We also have a very beloved program called Materials for the Arts, which is a 35,000 square foot warehouse of materials that we receive in don as donations and uh, give out for free to the arts and cultural sector. And of course, we have our public art program. Um, our percent for our program is our a permanent commissioning program of public art across the city, and those are connected to capital projects. And then we have our more temporary uh, cyclical program called Public Artists in Residence, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So no story I think about municipal residencies could begin um, elsewhere. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, I think, the origin story for all of us. Uh, Merle Letterman Eucalese, I think, was the first municipal artist in residence, and she came to the New York City Department, in Sanita of, Department of Sanitation in 1977, where she actually remains to this day. Um, Merle came to New York City uh, at a time of, or to the you know, Department of Sanitation specifically at a time where the city was in a major fiscal crisis, uh, not unlike today. Morale was incredibly low uh, among the municipal workers, the, the sanitation workforce, but of course among the city as a whole. And there, there needed to be, the city was looking for ways to kind of build trust and sort of pride among its workforce and its residents. And so Merle from day one has been creating you know, a range of works from the serious to the whimsical and sometimes in combination to really both publicly as well as privately internal to the city, um, honor and pay tribute to uh, the municipal workforce. This work that you're looking at here uh, is one of her more famous, most famous pieces called Touch Sanitation from the late 70s, where she literally went and shook the hand of every single sanitation worker and looked them in the eye and said, thank you for keeping New York City alive. Um, I think there is no more poignant work, frankly, uh, today in this moment with COVID um, than this piece. And in fact, there's a, a, a new version of it uh, currently on display in Times Square. Um, so anyway, Merle, Merle is sort of the person that we hold up in high regard and that we look to, uh, to shape and influence uh, what PEAR looks like today, which is a little bit different. So our new pair program, which launched in 2015, um, is basically a one-year residency program, which anyone who's working in the arts and anyone working in municipalities knows that one year is not a lot of time to do a lot of stuff. Um, but nevertheless, um, we are bound by lots of uh, framework constraints that I'll talk about in a little bit, one of them being the fiscal cycle. So we have one year to spend the money, we have one year to make the projects happen. We also offer about four residencies per year. Um, and the residencies are paid, which is very different from Merle's time. She, uh, in all the 40 some odd years she's been with the, uh, with the city, she has never been uh, salaried or compensated for her work. But in this case now, I'm very pleased that we can pay our artists. Um, since the program began in 2015, we've worked with 22 artists in a variety of mediums, um, photographer, mural maker, social practice, theater, um, one thing we haven't had yet is a dancer, but I'm working on that. Um, and we've worked with about 14 different agencies, who, and the, that has ranged wildly as well. We've had the Commission on Human Rights, we've had Immigrant Affairs, Office of Sustainability, Veteran Services, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, what's been really exciting for us, and I think one of the moments where we feel like we really kind of hit our stride or, or hit on something that was really powerful was that Organ, um, agencies started coming to us too, asking to participate in our program. And so once that started happening, we, uh, as I said, we, we kind of realized that there was a momentum and, and an excitement and a, something was clicking in what we were doing. And so now we not only do an open call for artists to participate in our program, but we also have a competitive application process for agencies to participate. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this slide is that, you know, the, the key, I think, to all of the municipal residencies that we've had, and, and perhaps for, for others that we'll hear about today, is this idea of embedding. 
Um, we're not plopping an artist into an agency, you know, to just do whatever they want. And we're not, you know, we're not asking um, the artists to do something that the agency demands. The, the whole idea is that this work is happening collaboratively and that there is a deep embedding process where the partners are getting to know each other. Um, they're asking questions, they're challenging ideas, um, and just spending time in each other's spaces to see how everybody works. Um, riffing on that, uh, I also want to emphasize that it's not just about the artist and the host agency, but that cultural affairs plays a very pivotal role as well. And without the sort of three prongs, this partnership, uh, the residencies really wouldn't be possible. Um, as, as I'm sure many of our uh, folks in the audience know, you know, an, the artists and municipalities may not always speak the same language. Um, an artist may have a lot of amazing ideas and then come like crashing into a wall of bureaucracy and not know how to navigate that. Uh, likewise, an agency might have a lot of really big ambitious ideas, but also expect the artist to speak in quantifiable metrics. Um, and uh, you know may may not understand why an artist can't do that. Um, and so cultural affairs, uh, me in particular, I work as kind of an interpreter, a translator, a support, a therapist, um, whatever is needed in the moment to unstick a problem and help mo move the project forward. And I think without the three pieces, without everybody sort of bought in and committed to the plot to the process, um, it, it would fail. When we go into a, um, a, a residency, there are a couple of requirements that we ask the agencies to be prepared to provide. And the first is senior level commitment or senior level buy-in. And I'm not talking about the head of a department or the head of a unit. Um, we're talking about commissioner to commissioner. Um, the first thing that happens is that our team goes in to meet the commissioner of the other unit of the other agency and says, like, do you understand what it means to have an artist here? Um, are you prepared to feel exposed? You know, when someone comes into your house on, uninvited and they see all your dirty laundry, they might mention it, you know, they might, um, you have to be prepared for um, that kind of vulnerability um, and you have to be prepared to self-reflect based on, on what is being observed. Um, with the staff level, sorry, with the senior level commitment is uh, also the dedicated staff support that comes with that. So if this, you know, if the commissioner is saying, yes, I'm committed to seeing this happen. Yes, I believe that art artists have value and, you know, and I'm prepared to see what they can do here. It also means that they can assign staff to help see the project forward. There also has to be an understanding that th there are limitations of what the artist can do. One artist, one year for $40,000 is not going to solve a whole agency's problems. Um, it can name problems and it could test ideas to address those problems, but it's not going to be the remedy for everything. Um, and that kind of expectation management, I think, happens at the beginning. There also has to be an expectation or a preparedness to take risks, including the risk that something might not actually manifest publicly. There may be a lot of fits and starts um, and it may fizzle out and that that is part of the process. It doesn't happen in every case, but sometimes it does. And of course, the expectation that everything takes time and that agency that the agency has to be patient. Um, we all know that to establish trust and to work at the pace of trust takes time and patience. Oh, and I'm sorry, I haven't been mentioning the beautiful images here of, of works, uh, but what you see on this screen is one of my favorite works, actually. Uh, in 2018, an artist named Rachel Barnard came into the Department of Probation and created something called the Wisdom Pavilion. Um, and actually, this, the reason why this image is on this slide is because Anna Bermudez, who is the commissioner for the Department of Probation, was exactly the kind of leader who was ready to take risks and understood from all the different um, programs that she has developed before and the research that she had been exposed to that you know arts can be transformative and particularly um, with respect to people on probation and the probation officer and client relationship there's a lot of potential there for deep do, um, new thinking in terms of what that relationship can look like and so Rachel Barnard was brought in and in similar fashion to Merle she shook everybody's hand she met every employee of the department of probation and talked about uh, and you know, and listened to them about what would 
what is required in order to sort of lift up and change the dynamic between probation officer and client. And it turned out that the space that the interviews were being conducted and the conversation prompts that were being used, all of that needed to be revisited and reimagined in a way that felt uplifting and aspirational and so what she did was she created a wisdom pavilion which as you can see is this like beautiful pinwheel structure uh, that was um, activated with a bunch of ceiling fans and other oscillating fans and the interview between officer and client took place inside the pavilion um, and it just transformed the feeling of what it was like to you know to report to this meeting um, and it changed the feeling both for the officer and for the client alike. Um, the prerequisites for the artists, uh, not dissimilar from what we expect from the agencies, but first of all, you have to have an interest in municipal systems. You know, th this is a very rare, uh, a very bizarre, unique opportunity. Um, an artist can find a lot of other residencies to do work in, you know, in different contexts, but for this experience, I think we're looking for artists who are curious about how the government works and all are also curious about challenging um, challenging the way uh, government works and kind of offering ideas and solutions so someone who's curious to you know interrogate those processes we're also looking for uh, artists who have a collaborative arts practice you know this this work can't happen in a vacuum um, it works best when an artist is willing and open to share their process and has a has a practice that is a collaborative uh, and you know and in, in part it's it's because this is this is very new for a lot of um, municipal workers and for them to come aboard or to come along there has to be a dialogue so it's very important that the artists who join us are are skilled and open to that kind of work obviously flexibility and adaptability um, comes with the territory because uh, bureaucratic systems are challenging in a lot of ways um, and sometimes you don't get the result you want and the reason why this image is on this slide is because janet zweig worked with the mayor's office of sustainability last year to create another um, what i think is one of our more exciting projects which is uh, if you can see these uh, dials these sort of vintage old dials um, situated inside the the archways of this building 31 chambers actually where the department of cultural affairs office is but this is on a main drag right in downtown new york situated across from city hall and in her conversations with the mayor's office of sustainability she kept hearing the phrase move the needle move the needle and everyone was very passionate about moving the needle moving the needle on climate change moving the needle on people's perception of their power to combat climate change and so of course um she that that phrase kind of stuck with her and she created this uh this rendering for this potential installation well installations on government buildings forget about any building but government buildings are challenging uh and it was expensive even just to draft the you know draft the designs for what this could look like um, and it was challenging to get permissions, you know, there, we had to get the fire department and the department of uh, buildings involved and um, the, you know, the, the office of administrative services. Anyway, long story short, this project didn't manifest yet, uh, but we've, you know, we've spent the money and we've spent the time, uh, but procurement takes longer. So while we're hoping that we can realize this project in the coming year, um, fortunately, Janet was the kind of is the kind of artist who is, you know, willing to go with the flow um, and recognizes that to meet, to, you know, to create something so ambitious, you, you have to be flexible. I, I touched on a few of these items before, but there are definitely constraints uh, that the agent that the program is working within. One obviously is that of time, and I think I covered that. Uh, one year is not a lot of time. We definitely have a lot of pro, uh, residencies that extend. Um, but that has to be, you know, desired by both stakeholders, both the artist and the host agency. And if one can't do it, then it doesn't happen. But so the commitment that we're asking people to make from jump is for one year. Funding for the program is $40,000, uh, which, you know, at the beginning may sound like a lot, but it goes very quickly. Uh, 40,000 is inclusive, both of the artists fee that we ask them to take them for themselves, but it also includes costs for fabrication and implementation. So if you're paying other people to participate, if you are contracting an, uh, an architect for the, for, to draft drawings, if you have to, you know, customize meters and dials, 
and have those, you know, have steel come from China, that money goes quickly. Um, and so in thinking about, you know, again, managing expectations, we're always very upfront with the fact that this money will move quickly. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, municipal systems, bureaucracy, the left hand doesn't always talk to the right. Contracting can take time. Um, just generally, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this in our conversation, but, um, you know, what's beautiful about having an artist in city government is that the, like oftentimes, most, in most times that I've seen, artists work just completely counter to the the pace and the weight of what it work what it's like to work in a government system and so that juxtaposition or that challenge is is can sometimes be it can sometimes cause friction and then just fiscal and organizational constraints an organiz an, an agency might say yeah i have forty thousand dollars to spend on this today but then in you know a couple of months there may be a budget cut similarly for ourselves you know for myself personally I'm one person managing a lot of projects, including this. And while I wish that PEAR had more staff capacity, um, more funding for evaluation and documentation, we just don't have that. And so we're limited in what we can do, of course, because of the budget constraints. Let me check the time. Um, one of the reasons why this, uh, this images on this screen is because the Lost Collective worked with the Administration for Children's Services and this was literally an exercise in managing expectations and pivoting all the time. Um, we, we started with uh, a collective of four artists and as I mentioned before the $40,000 fee goes doesn't go far and all of a sudden it had to be split between four people so the funding was very limited already. Also, the goal here for this work was to engage LGBTQ identified youth in foster, foster care homes. Well, there were five homes and they were scattered all over the city and just traveling between the homes took way longer than anybody anticipated. And once the, once the um, artists got to the homes, some of the, some of the youth were in school or some of them were you know, picked up another part-time job somewhere. So just connecting um, was challenging and it kind of, it, it kept requiring a reimagining of what the not just what the final kind of presentation would be, but what is it that what is it that these um, these young people needed, and also what does what did ACS what did the um, Administration for Children's Services need out of this program? Um, this was also challenged by the fact that. Um, there was not senior level buy-in into this program. There were, you know, department heads and even deputy commissioners were very excited about it, but the program kept getting stuck. Um, it kept getting stuck in requiring metrics to evaluate the efficacy of the artist engagement with the youth, when, all, when in fact the youth just needed people to talk to. So while in the end it manifested into a beautiful presentation of youth work, you know, some of them decided they wanted to vogue and some of them wanted a model and some of them wanted to compose music. And, uh, you know, there was just a range of, um, of activities that took place. You know, we went from saying, okay, well, we need to target these 30 kids. They all have to be involved in this program. We're going to do some theatrical work together, blah, blah, blah. It ended up being, we're going to connect deeply for a sustained period of time with four people. And if we can do that well, then this program will have been a success. And that's what we walked away with. Um, but I think for ACS, it was a challenge because they're working with thousands of kids and they couldn't bring this to scale. Ah, I have so little time left. Okay. Um, so switching from framework, you know, constraints to opportunities. Um, I want to share another work about um, with, uh, sorry, another work by Tanya Bruguera, who joined us uh, in the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to do, to create something called Cycle News in 2016, which I think is a perfect um, reflection of some of the opportunities uh, that can be, that can be seized. So Tanya Bruguera, um, when she came on to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the idea was that she was going to work with um, this IDNYC program. It was our municipal arts pro, uh, municipal ID card program uh, that was going to be open to anyone, included undocumented workers, to be able to tap into a range of services that the city provided. And there was a lot of concern that undocumented workers would not participate in the program. So she was brought on to kind of help establish trust between, um, you know, undocumented workers and the government. And um, once she got there, she realized, we all realized, well, hey, this is going off like gangbusters. We don't really need any focus on IDNYC. Like, what, what, like, what can we do together? Um, and it turned out that uh, she kept playing with this idea of trust 
And she kept thinking, you know, you keep trying to message out to undocumented workers about what you're doing, but how do you get, you know, how are you trusting the messages or how are you carefully listening to um, your communities and how, what are you doing with the information that you're getting and how are you helping that influence your systems? And so what she did was she created a messenger, uh, a bike messenger service where uh, a group of women from Corona Queens, Mujeres en Movimiento, which was uh, already a collective of very actively uh, engaged women, became bike messengers on behalf of the city of New York, taking into their community information with these pictograms that were also created for the program. Um, about, you know, um, like 100% legitimate, you know, city certified resources and supports for the community. But at the same time that they were going into, you know, to provide this information, they were surveying, uh, surveying residents about what services worked, what services did they need, what are some of their concerns, what is it about the government that they distrusted, and brought that information back to the city. And fortunately, with the senior level buy-in that we had at Moya at the time, and even still to this day, that the, the information that the mujeres were able to bring back to the city really did change and enhance the services that Moya provided. And so um, it was not only a successful program, it also became something that um, had a lasting impact on the agency. It also became, you know, it's also a reflection of a project that can be scaled. We tested this in one neighborhood with one group of women, um, but Moya is very excited about the potential for doing this kind of deep uh, community engagement in this way in other neighborhoods going forward. I will end with this slide, looking ahead. Um, what you're seeing here right now is how we are communicating with our artists today. Um, in the middle is Yasmani Arboleda. He is our one of our newest um, artists in residence. He's working with the Commission on Civic Engagement, which is a brand new commission that was established last year uh, with the goal of bringing more people into civic participation. And all of their intentions were to, you know, hit the ground, like boots on the ground, in-person contact. Well, of course, COVID-19 happened and, um, and we don't know kind of what the future holds. Um, but this, this screen here is Yasmani actually giving uh, a presentation to the staff of the CEC about his previous work and sharing with them for the first time, you know, what his ambitions are and his dreams are uh, for his residency and, and sharing also about what he's been learning during his time at the CEC so far. Um, and so to me, it's a, just an uplifting, it's, it's like this weird image of, you know, how we're conducting business today, which is so bizarre. Um, but it's also exciting uh, because I think that this new, these new challenges will present new opportunities. Um, I think I've spoken for long enough. So that is, that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shirley. I know you felt a little rushed there at the end, uh, but <laughs> Like you've already answered half my questions. Like that was such a <laughs> wonderful presentation. You touched on so many of the key issues and certainly a first for me, several people in the chat halfway through your talk were already expressing how excited they are that they'll get to watch this again. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, no, it really, uh, yeah, we, um, we know that, that, you know, Meryl's project really is, you know, the godmother of these programs. And, and I love that you started off with that. And certainly it's, you know, as, as an artist, you learn from other artists and then you have these moments where you're like, I will never do anything as wonderful as that, you know, and that shaken hands project in terms of the issues that I'm interested in um, and the connections that I explore in my work. Yeah, it's, it's you know what's what's interesting about Merle though is that you know she you know she has the benefit of you know of looking back, mm -hmm. and she I think understands also that what ha what she's been able to achieve is so hard to replicate now. You know when yeah. she and I sit together on a panel and talk about the then and now and the everything in between, she she advocates for the kind of residencies that we're doing now because she understands that the world is moving faster, that there are different needs, that just like the way we look, about, look at government work is maybe a little bit different. Um, so she kind of gives, she has given us her blessing to go forward in this way. And it's really, um, it's just very heartwarming to know that she kind of approves of this um, at having paved the way for it. And it's so unmunicipal that she's still there, if I can say. <laughs> like, you would not think that any city would support 
and engage with an artist for that yeah. length of time. And so yeah. Um, yeah. I, I agree it's not necessarily replicable, but it's also, yeah. I think, yeah. offers us a lot to think about. So yes. okay, I'm going to move has, on. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Last. I just going to say, she has, she has like outlived eight commissioners of sanitation, <laughs> which I think is a testament to her, you know, to the, to the power of the work that she's created and the impact that it's had on the sanitation department. Well, I think there are many artists who would be interested and willing to commit for that long. But as I said, it's rare to be yeah. supported and given the opportunity to engage. Lots of people do it privately. There's lots of people who do 10 year, 20 year projects under their own steam and build relationships with communities. But it's obviously difficult to sustain without infrastructural support. And so it's really a, a testament to, you know, the vision of, you know, your, your staff over the generations that have, have continued. So. So uh, moving on, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce Carolyn Bowen, who's going to give us our second presentation. Um, Carolyn Bowen is the manager of Watershed Planning at the City of Calgary. She's been with the City of Calgary for 20 years and is passionate about public service, public art, and the environment. As manager of Watershed Planning in the Water Utility, Bowen and her team ensure Calgary's watershed is healthy today, into the future, and resilient to floods and drought. Through education and outreach programs, they connect citizens to our rivers. Owen works with the Watershed Plus Art Program and has an MSc and a Master's Certificate in Municipal Leadership. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. And uh, I had some significant uh, tech challenges earlier. I'm hoping this will work. My computer actually died. <laughs> so I'm on my home laptop. Um, Can you see my screen? Yeah, you're great. Thank goodness. And you can hear me. Absolutely. You're good to go. This is a bonus. All right. <laughs> your patience and your grace. We're, we're here. Let's go. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, so thank you so much for having me, Shirley. That was a great presentation. Um, and again, full disclosure, I'm not an artist. I'm a scientist. And so I may bring a different perspective. Um, but I want to share the story of uh, Calgary's Watershed Plus program and, uh, and really talk about how that, how that grew and what it's about. Um, but I want to start with um, a quote from Hesse McGraw, who's the Executive Director at Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. And he wrote in our, uh, a really awesome essay around our uh, Watershed Plus program. I often wonder when public art will get beyond the thingness, public art is a hybrid field. It bridges the civic and the personal, the city with the gallery, connects politicians to artists and brings the world into our backyard. And we plug these gaps with objects. Our most basic expectation of public art are to achieve a monument, a site or an artwork recognizable as a thing. If that's, not, if that's our manual, it is necessary, it is nearly impossible to put anything called art in public without it being seen as public art. Yet we know happiness comes not through things, but through experience. And civic pride is less a product of monuments than a building up of emotions about place. What it feels like to experience the city. Is the city alive? Is it urgent inexpressibly itself? Is it a place where I fell in love or one could fall in love? For a place earning thereness, is less about having things to see than having experiences to give and keep giving. And to me, that really encapsulates the story of, um, of our Watershed Plus program. So the City of Calgary's art um, policy, oops, sorry, I'm working on two computers, sorry about that, um, was approved and within that policy, was given the guidelines for, um, for the uh, art budget, which was really, um, you know, 1% of our capital projects up to $50 million would be allocated to public art and 0.5% for the portion over 50 million. So um, it was really focused on, um, on the capital projects capped at $4 million. 
So the foundation was really important in developing a way of working and that set the foundation for our public art program. But our utilities and environmental protection department in the city, so I will hereby call it UEP. Um, so our, our utilities environmental protection department, which is made up of water, our waste and recycling group, as well as our environmental group, said what they wanted to do was pool that money. And so rather than, you know, put the money towards individual projects, we wanted to pool it as a department and let's create something different. And so this created an incredible opportunity um, for us to move forward on. And so out of that, the UEP public art plan um, was, was founded and it was founded on the principle that public art in collaboration with other disciplines can create remarkable places that encourage sustainability and the stewardship of the environment. And that was a real focus of our UEP art plan. And it was to foster a series of cohesive art projects and events that relate specifically to Calgary's watershed and particularly to our river, the Bow River, which flows through Calgary. And the important intention of the plan was to integrate art into public infrastructure and through intercollaboration, interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. So out of our UEP art plan came Watershed Plus. And Watershed Plus is a program that defines how artists and cities will work together. And so it took you know, the concepts from, the, from our broader UEP art plan and really started, you know, it, it's about embedding artists and artistic practices within our utility um, and really focus on the core activities of, this, of uh, the utility. Um, and when I say the utility, I'm referring to water. The vision of Watershed Plus was to build an emotional connection and a long lasting relationship between our people and their watershed. And it uses artists and artistic processes to really get down and start uncovering some of those hidden, hidden processes and systems, um, you know, like infrastructure, for example, and really highlight them and look at how we can connect our citizens and, and community to some of these. So, um, we had a project manager that uh, developed the UEP art plan. And so with her and a group of um, advisors and, and water subject matter experts, um, a competition was put out and Song Fasson, our uh, lead artists were selected to actually be our artists um, from a period of about September 2011 right through to June 2016. So they were embedded within the water utility and they are a Calgary based um, art practice that really focuses on that relationship between people and place. Whoops. And what is that place? Well, the place that we talk about a lot is, um, is the city of Calgary. And on that satellite image, you can see kind of a, a gray patch. That's the city of Calgary to the right of the Rocky Mountains. And the city of Calgary is situated at the confluence of the Bow River and the Elbow River. So we've got two rivers that meet. And the Bow Watershed, when we talk about Watershed Plus and we talk, we use that word a lot, it really is that area of surrounding land that drains into the Bow River. So all of our rain, snow, glacier melt goes into the river, everything drains there and the river flows through Calgary. So that just kind of positions what we're talking about. It's a very large area and we've got a city of 1.3 million people. And because we are very close, we're about 200, 250 kilometers from the source of, our, um, of the Bow River, which is the Bow Glacier. We're very lucky. We have fairly clean, pristine water coming through Calgary, and it is absolutely a resource to be treasured. So a lot of our focus in Watershed Plus was about that resource. Whoops, sorry, I'm on a, I've got a crazy mouse here. Um, so when Saint Fasson started, they really wanted to try to understand what is that relationship with people and the river. And going right to the headwaters, which I just talked about, up by the glacier, um, they really realized there is a significant power 
powerful relationship. Um, it's, it's wild, it's, it's natural, it's pristine, it's really, really awesome. And when you go up to the headwaters, it, it's absolutely amazing. And um, as you start going down the river, in those, you know, down that 200 and some kilometers, the relationship starts changing. And um, when we actually look at the Bow River in the city, we find that it becomes more utility focused and, and more utilitarian. You know, we have three lines of service at our water utility. One is around drinking water, making sure that we've got, um, you know, clean drinking water. One is around making sure we're treating the wastewater and then it goes back clean into the river. And that third line of service is about um, managing our stormwater, so our rainwater that washes into the river. So just exploring what that relationship looks like downstream um, really provided a lot of context for our lead artists. And they also really wanted to start looking at what's underground. Let's explore the hidden. Let's explore the com complex, the out of mind. As a utility, we have about 12 to 14,000 kilometers of pipe underground. We have about 60% of our assets as a city are underground and it's a total hidden world and, uh, and, and very, um, very invisible. Most citizens don't actually um, connect with it or see it unless something happens like a, a huge water break. Such as that. Um, so a lot of our staff in the past, a lot of our managers and engineers would say, yeah, it's much better if people don't connect with that part of our system. Uh, they really don't need to. They need to turn the tap on, water comes out, that's kind of what they need. But how we interact with our customers and our citizens is really changing. And we really want customers to really understand the value of the work that we do. So once the artists you know, really started exploring relationships and understanding things. We really, you know, wanted to make sure that they, as Shirley said, it's about embedding them into our business and into our work. Um, and, you know, this was a place that the artists felt that, um, you know, they could really think about their role in an expanded way. And they really embraced kind of a broader, um, idea of, hey, you know, we can contribute further to the connection of our environment. And I think one of the key things and one of the key success, um, success aspects around this is that so many people within our water utility, right from our general manager down to all of our, all kinds of staff, our lab staff, um, our engineers, our field staff really embrace this. And, um, you know, so Watershed Plus, the program itself, is really invisible to the art world. Um, it's being tucked away in the administration, but the significance of the process, or of the program really lies in the process. And embedding those creative processes with the day-to-day -day management of the watershed and how we deliver services made this program unique at the time. Oh my gosh, sorry about that. Um, so while working within the water center, you know, because this was an extended period, um, the artists were really able to establish relationships and build trust with staff. The essential element of this is collaboration. And, um, you know, over the years, uh, the staff and the artists would work together um, and really get to know each other. And there was a huge, huge amount of trust that was built over time. And, um, you know, what, what I saw as a utility, we moved away from asking, hmm, do we want public art on this project to, is this a project where we need the artist at the table? And because we, we knew and we understood that it really does create that space for different discussion and different groups of people um, to question some of those assumptions that we in the utility would, would make all the time. Uh, one of the first examples um, of a project um, came out of, uh, our lead artists, Tristan and Charles, were invited to a meeting to talk about 
water fountains. And, you know, we were looking at, is there a way we can provide water fountains to the public during events so we don't have to use water bottles? And so they invited the artists and said, hey, can you help us? We've got these, you know, these um, developed uh, drinking water fountains. Uh, we need some decals. We need, you know, what can we do to them? And uh, the lead artist took it away and said, can you give us a week? Let's just see what we can do. And, you know, kind of started asking different questions. So a week later, they came back and they brought back the idea of developing specific water fountains that would express that connection to the hydrant more visibly and create a real um, sense of intrigue from the public while maintaining the functional uh, drinking fountain. So once the go-ahead was given, hey, we trust you, go for it. There was a lot of work working with our, you know, like 36 people in total came together to create this uh, program. And it was, so now you've got the artists working with our, some of our machinists and our fire hydrant people and, um, you know, all kinds of people they probably never envisioned that they would be working with. And as I said, in the end, 36 people were engaged and contributed to the project. And I was thinking about this, if this was not a municipal project, imagine trying to wrangle 36 people to create um, a set of drinking fountains. It would be <laughs> extremely difficult. Uh, a lot of money would have been spent. And at the end of the day, once the project was done, all 36 people were around the table and celebrated and paid for with pizza. And, um, but it really just goes to show that the opportunities within the municipalities is, is quite amazing. And what came out of it was a great example of applying creative thinking and a creative process to practical problems and, and also a means of using public art to address some of those civic uh, challenges and enhance our communities. And this was one of the first projects and it really set a great stage and a tone for, wow, this is really cool. We still use these water fountains. Um, and they really are about connecting our citizens to our most basic need, which, which is water. And um, so, the, you know, the fountains themselves are really the vehicle or stage. I know Tristan and Charles would say that. And the art is really created with the, with the citizens um, engaging with them. Um, another great example of, again, it has to do with geography and being embedded within the organization. Um, again, a hallway conversation between our lead artists and some staff that actually work in, in our labs, in our water quality labs. Um, after a lot of conversations, it was, hey, um, why don't we start looking at what that story looks like? How do our lab technicians tell the story? Um, and Bee Kingdom, it's a Calgary-based art collective, was commissioned to research the water and wastewater treatment processes in Calgary and really get a glimpse of that incredible world of microbiology, looking through the microscopes and see what the lab technicians see all the time. And it's obviously a, a vital part of our water and our wastewater treatment um, process. So Bee Kingdom spent six months um, embedded in our labs at the water treatment and wastewater plants where they were closely working with our lab staff. And the challenge was really to apply their expertise and create um, you know, a, a work of art through glass on some of these interesting um, microbes. And uh, you know, so they really looked, what are those helpful organisms that help clean our, our water? And what are some of the more scary and detrimental ones um, and at the end, they ended up bringing our, our lab technicians, the ones who spend most of their day with a microscope, actually into their studio. Um, and it was a really, you know, a reciprocal thing. They were able to exchange knowledge both ways. And at the end of the day, um, we got some very amazing um, glass products of, uh, we got two sets of these, uh, yeah, amazing microbes that are in our water. And it really told the story from the lab perspective. They were just thrilled. Um, we have a Watershed Plus um, residency program. And in 2013 and 2014, 
four artists um, were in residence at, at various studios within Calgary. And through that residency, really the expectation of the artists was that they would be engaging with the community in a dialogue that explored and looked at issues that were relevant to Calgary's watershed and water management. Um, and the residency obviously provided artists with time, space, and resources in a very unique context within the municipal facility. And in turn, what we got is the City of Calgary staff, artists, community, and the public, and the opportunity to engage with, a, with new work of national and, and international significance. Um, and it was significant. And, um, you know, one of the uh, artists that, and there's so many, but I just am going to highlight uh, Rachel Deckhaus um, was one of our artists in residence. And, you know, she took how do you represent abstract and invisible patterns? And, um, you know, she went that that actually drew her to some of our river engineers. And they started looking at the complexity of fluid dynamics and ecology and really looked at how does water flow through Calgary? And what came out of it was this large uh, bow flow, it's called an eight foot pen and ink drawing um, that maps out Calgary's Bow River as it travels through, um, through the city. And so, you know, she had made this based on consultation with employees, looking at photos, memories, stories, data, and her work was displayed at the truck gallery in downtown Calgary. Well, a week later, um, we had this little thing called the flood. Um, it was a one in 100 year flood and, you know, caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage and, and we lost some lives as a result. Um, but she, again, demonstrating flexibility and adaptability, she, she took that and she actually researched ways of recording that flood and the dynamics. And what she did was create another layer on her original uh, uh, artwork and that really shows um, you know, the darker lines on this show the Bow River during springtime and then what it looked like and how it flowed during the flood. It was actually quite fascinating. Um, I'm going to, there was, there's so many great um, projects and things to, to talk about. This one was kind of a temporary one where um, you know, we really, the artist Broken City Lab um, really took a playful approach and um, at our stormwater outfalls in this all throughout the city, there was about a hundred of them. They asked these questions that you would ask in say a normal relationship or with someone, you know, is the river curious? And it was uh, really provocative and really created a lot of dialogue for our community. Again, it's about connecting with the river. Um, another um, program that Watershed Plus did was the dynamic environment lab and again this is about bringing artists in immersing themselves in the utility and really trying to make sure you know that there is that understanding of the calgary context what are those challenges and um, kind of the environment that that people want to connect with and really promoting collaborative and interactive art around this particular um, environment lab and this one really focused on the changing environment our environment is dynamic city of calgary is no stranger to natural disasters and how do we live in this constant and shifting complex world of the natural environment and um so again it was um the one I'm going to highlight here is, is Becky Shaw and, um, you know, how deep is your love? What she did was she actually um, kind of focused on that point where residents need and, and the civic responsibility come into contact and sometimes in conflict, for example, when we have a water leak. And so what she did was she followed our city staff that have these they're called analog geophones. They put them on and they actually listen to um, the sound underground and hearing where we have leaks and within the pipes and the infrastructure. So she did a lot of work, kind of reassembled it, made it very um, 
available to a broader group of people and you know worked with kids worked with uh, citizens really making these tools available and trying to connect people to that um, underground world of infrastructure. Um, the last project I am going to highlight is uh, Dale Hodges Park and this is a park in Calgary that is named after a very long serving councillor and it's a remarkable story um, and I'm not sure how many municipalities would give an infrastructure and naturalization project of this scale and magnitude to artists to lead from the beginning, but that's um, what had happened. There is this uh, piece of land that was a former um, gravel pit, a gravel mine. It was contaminated and our parks department really wanted it to um, we wanted to revitalize it and rehabilitate the natural environment because it's a very important natural environment in, um, in Calgary along the river. At the same time, water needed a place to filter out our stormwater. And on the screen there is um, that diagram to the right that shows kind of all the different neighborhoods, the, the blue color, that's the catchment of um, neighborhoods, all of that stormwater. So when we get rain or snow melt, all of those neighborhoods filter down into the river. So we needed a way to try to, um, to treat that stormwater. Parks and water have been at battles for years and years about using public space, uh, amenities versus uh, stormwater management. So this was a really big challenge. Um, and again, sans façon, came in and um, they were leading the project and you know it was it was quite fascinating they hired the landscape architect worked with consultants um, led the project from the beginning it took years and years and years it was not easy absolutely not easy um, we had consultants come in and people come in with kind of a here's the plan it's a fait accompli um, and so trying to pose questions and challenge assumptions um, actually ended up an amazing, amazing result. And what came out of it, we just had our grand opening um, not too long ago. And it's a, it's a unique collaboration between parks, water and public art. And with respect to stormwater, it actually um, brings that visibility to how stormwater comes down from neighborhoods, how it's treated, um, they created these structures so when it's raining you go down or after the rain you go down and you see all this water coming out of the structure and it goes into these into a nautilus pond it's a really really large pond that settles um, out the sediment and all the things we don't want going into the river there's a very cool and beautiful halo drain where the, where the water goes into and that water then travels through a creek into this huge filtration system, which is made up of native vegetation. And the photo you see there is a, it's early days. Um, it's the vegetation hasn't established, but it really is about cleaning that water as well as um, uh, providing habitat for, for wildlife. And so it comes out the channel and into the boat. It is a most amazing project. Um, I know I'm running it, I probably ran out of time, but just wanted to say, um, you know, we, we did produce a book, it's got recommendations, it's got um, uh, interviews, it, it talks about kind of it's a succession plan, um, interviews from staff and artists and, you know, what were some of the benefits and challenges. And um, it's, it's a pretty amazing read, I will say. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, when, when I think about our artists and, and having them embedded in our Watershed Plus program, they really, you know, brought forward that role of relationship builders and fostering trust and respect. I probably, hands down, those are the most important things for moving some of these these programs forward um, and that time element as well taking the time to understand the context get behind it um, work with our staff and that genuine intrigue and learning and being able to work it just like um, Shirley said in that municipal context not everyone can 
Um, it is bureaucratic and it, it does come with challenges, um, but the innovation and kind of the change that they brought within the utility to our staff and how we now view projects. I, uh, my project engineers are, I, I need to bring an artist in. We can't do this without the artists at the table with equal voices. It's quite amazing to see. Um, so yeah, and, and really not as an add-on, but rather a way of being. That has definitely come through loud and clear. The incredible amount of value that they've added to the organization which then reflects on how we deliver services to our community. So it really has been um, quite an amazing journey. And with that, thank you very much. And thanks for putting up with my tech issues. <laughs> it was wonderful. Wow. Uh, that quote that you started off with too, uh, you know, it's, there's so much to be cynical about when it comes to our municipal governments. And both of you have offered us um, such wonderful, inspiring models um, for ways that municipal government can, um, you know, really add, add to the quality of life and of, of living in a city. Um, and I just love the pairing of, of both of your projects because, you know, surely New York's, your project is, you know, individual artists, you know, department, 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 which is wonderful. And then here's a different model of one department working with multiple artists in multiple ways over time in sort of connected issues. And I think, uh, yeah, it's um, on, this, on this gray day, I'm feeling very excited and hopeful. And, you know, uh, your presentations were great and wonderful. We don't have much time. So I have a lot of questions, but I really also want to prioritize the audience because I'm hoping that who is attending this session is lots of people in cities all over the place who want to to, to launch and implement programs like what we've heard about today. Um, but just to start off, you both use the word embedded quite a few times. Um, and I think we, can, we, we, we might make some assumptions about what that means, but I'm just really curious to hear from you both to unpack that a little bit more. What does embedded actually concretely look like? What does that mean in, in terms of practical terms? I, I can go. Um, so from our perspective, it was about practically providing office space within our utility. They are sitting with our water quality people, our business strategists, our customer care people. They are there right in the middle. And that's kind of that first step is getting them absolutely, um, you know, embedded. It, it really is physically. For us, the physical piece uh, is, is just as important. We, we require that uh, office space is provided to the artist for them to use as they wish. I think that's an important thing to say that, you know, we're not asking the artist to be there 24 seven or whatever, or nine to five or whatever, but that there is a space available that they should come and feel like they are a part of the agency. Um, and then beyond that, you know, every agency kind of handles it differently. Sometimes the artist is given a work email address or sometimes they're given a phone and whatever. But the most important thing, you know, so other than being physically there is the availability of, or the, I guess the access to information. So yeah. we, the artists are, there's an expectation that the artists will be in, um, invited to meetings, can actively participate can ask questions, can challenge, you know, whatever it is that they're, whatever they're hearing. Um, we encourage a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and so that there's a, so that the artists can have a real opportunity to um, concretely understand how the agency functions. Yeah, and I was just gonna actually um, echo that in that the expectation was that our artists are welcome like to all of our events, to meetings, um, and it, it really was providing them opportunities to learn and even taking them out in the field with some of our frontline operators and you know, right up to sitting with our directors and really getting a sense of, of that. And that was kind of, there was tacit approval within the utility that yes, we are open to that. Yeah. I think there's also, oh, just one last thing to add. I know mm. we're so short on time, but. Um, it, I think for us, it's also important for the, um, 
especially since our time is so limited in a, in a course of a year for the staff at the agencies to be excited by the potential that an artist can bring. So it's not just about feeding information and providing access from the agency to the artist. The other way is equally important. We, you know, we're, we, we create opportunities for the artists to give talks about their work. Um, we used to schedule site visits now, you know, or studio visits. Now there's more like, you know, virtual presentations, but that there's a dialogue so that, um, so that some of the staff at the agency can also start to think like the artist, or even just to mm -hmm. have, you know, to be in kind of a generative idea, like a idea generated state to be excited. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, in my own limited experience so far, I also, it, you know, it, felt relevant and familiar. You both talked about sort of frictions and challenges in terms of, surely you mentioned the pace <laughs> at which artists work. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit more about those tensions and those frictions between the way that artists work and what you've learned from navigating those tensions between uh, you know, expectations for evaluation and outcomes um, and just what lessons can you offer the audience in terms of navigating those tensions? Um, I can say that I think communication is key, and I think that that's the, you know, the, uh, the sort of the critical role that we at Cultural Affairs play, um, because there is so much expectation and anticipation, so that when you hit a, a point of friction, it can be kind of compounded by all the pressure to produce something. Um, and I think that what we do is to say, it's okay. <laughs> the friction is part of the process. Let's work through it or like, let's sit with it for a minute. Let's feel it. And then let's figure out a way through it. Um, so I think real communication is, is essential. Um, we have weekly scheduled calls, you know, how's everybody doing? What are you doing? What didn't you do that you wished you could do? What could you do differently? Like we're really unpacking a lot of, um, we're just processing a lot in, in real time. Yeah, and I would agree with that 100%. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, that we found, if you provide that support system for the artists, like throwing artists into an area and saying they're embedded, is, it's not. And having the support system to navigate some of those bureaucratic challenges has been really important. And, and so absolutely, that communication, that, that line of understanding and being open. I know that, you know, myself and my predecessors, um, often took, you know, the approach to move hurdles and get through some of the barriers that, that were real, like working in a municipality. So being able to provide that support to, to our artists is really critical. I think that's a really, uh, the point you made really about normalizing the friction, you know, that this is, this is okay, this happens, um, and not to get frustrated, um, and that it's just, it, it just isn't, would be naturally inherent given the different ways of working. So I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, go ahead, yeah. I also, I just, I think also that, you know, for us, we always start the residency with a particular challenge or quest or like a framing question. And I think that, you know, that's just the beginning, right? There are some artists that stay, you know, hold that question the, for the duration of their residency, but that there are others who just, you know, use that as a departure point and go off on a completely different direction. And I think the communication is so essential because as the thing, as the work progresses and evolves or changes direction, it's important to, for the artist and for the agency stakeholders to feel like they've, they're aware, you know, that they've come along for that process, that it's not a surprise pivot or anything like that. So if you're communicating, you can kind of weather those changes over time. Yeah. <clears throat> so our first question from the audience, uh, why are municipal art programs so often grouped with economic development? Does this skew the mandates of art programs? We try really hard to distinguish between economic development and, and our residency program. I, there's no doubt that a case is, there's a very strong case for artists as drivers of the economy, particularly in New York. You know, there's a desire right now for artists and the cultural sector to pull us out of, you know, out of the, you know what, that we're in. Yeah. Um, but, but we, you know, our, our focus has always been, you know, in a lot of ways, like, Art for art's sake, art as a tool, but as a tool also for social well-being, for social cohesion, 
for for civic engagement, for community engagement, for you know, for for a, like a wealth of other things. Um, and so I actually don't think that um, at least at least for the most part, our our work in in our residency program has very, very much drawn that line. Ours as well. Um, we took a different focus. It really was focused on the environment and, and connecting, you know, our citizens and our community with our natural environment, the value um, of the utility of the services we provide, um, but really making that environmental connection. But, you know, so yeah, it, that wasn't um, an issue for, for Calgary, so. A question for you, Shirley. Does DCA offer pair artists budget building and project scope support? Does DCA connect pair artists with a roster of fabricators who you have strong connections with? Good question. And of course, because I work for government, there's, I can't answer that fully. Or there's, or there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Um, so we as a government agency cannot um, recommend uh, contractors or fabricators because of the, you know, of competition. But certainly we have um, a list of artists, particularly through our Percent for Art program, which is the, uh, the permanent commissions of, you know, hundreds of artists who have worked all over the city, who have had great partnerships with fabricators and designers, et cetera. And we do keep a list um, that we can refer to, um, but it's not organized, you know, in, in any kind of prioritization kind of way. But yes, there's, there is guidance that we provide. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to work with Kendall Henry, who I think also was invited to speak today, um, who's, you know, a top expert in, in commissioning public work. Uh, and he, you know, he advises the PEAR program um, as needed. Um, and we also bring in other PEAR uh, veterans to kind of talk about how, they, how they've planned and organized their work. Um, um, in terms of budgeting, also, absolutely. No, nothing about pair happens in a vacuum. So oftentimes what happens is an artist will conceive of an idea, and then you know, together with agency stakeholders, we're thinking about like, okay, well, what's feasible? What haven't we considered? What's gonna cost more? Let's, you know, let's work this out together. So definitely um, in terms of budgeting and, and planning for fabrication, it's, it's a, it's a collect, collaborative experience. Another question, ideally the duration would be longer than one year. What affordance is there for that? Is there a way of extracting ongoing change if not the artwork? So one of the, um, one of the beautiful outcomes I think of our pair program is that oftentimes I think the change happens internally. I think that you know, when the work can manifest and when it goes out and lives in the world, um, you know, there's a short and medium and long term experience that the, the, you know, that the public has with the work, but I do think that the lasting change happens internally with, you know, because of all the things that we've discussed, because it's, there's, you know, having an artist, you know, embedded, really genuinely embedded causes a mind shift. There's a, an enthu a new kind of curiosity or a new way to think about the municipal work that people are engaged in. There's a challenge or a questioning of the systems. Um, there's the kind of adrenaline that come, the rush of adrenaline that comes with risk taking um, mm -hmm. that you can do with an artist. Um, and I think that that has a very lasting impression on the agencies where the artists work, even if they have to leave for after a year. Um, that being said, yes, so we, we just ask that there be a year commitment um, but if an artist and an agency are interested in extending that partnership, we have no problem with that. We just say that it's like, it's non, um, there's like no financial commitment to that. We can't extend and add funding to the residency, um, but we can certainly extend the residency for as long as the parties are interested in, in working together. And even though we can't offer, uh, you know, tax levy dollars, um, in addition to what we've already provided, we do, we can actively fundraise in the private sector for, for projects. And we, you know, we sometimes artists go out and actively fundraise for projects, or sometimes we find other budgets that we can pull from. So there has to be a collective will um, and a capacity, but definitely extension is, is, you know, we're always excited about that prospect. Wonderful. And a question for you, Carolyn, uh, how would you differentiate the work and the person has put public artists in quotes from what landscape architect or designers would normally do. Um, I think with the artists, and this is what I saw during Dale Hodges Park, where we were working with landscape architects. Um, I think that the artists came in again with 
no assumptions, no predetermined end point, and um, really opened it absolutely wide open. And were able to work with the landscape architects who did have some boundaries to work within and you know, set, um, set processes. So I, I think from that perspective, it was, um, it was a little bit different just in terms of, of how they approached it. And um, you know, again, like I say, it's, it's, it's embracing the unknown, right? Just kind of wide open, you gotta be willing to do that. Um, but I would say that's probably one of the biggest differences. And one last question. I mean, I think we have, I mean, the, the theme of this panel sort of was like, yes, I do think there's a civic role for artists. I think we've, I think we've answered that question for sure. But just to wrap things up, one last question. What is in your mind, or what, is, what should be the artist's responsibility to the civic entity and to the people that that entity represents? Um. I guess I'll, I'll start and just say, I, I guess I always hope that what an artist can do is reflect back to the city what it does, because I think that through that self-reflect, I just think that self-reflection is so necessary and it's so easy to forget why we're doing what we're doing or what impacts we're having, you know, stated or unstated or known and unknown impacts. And I think that when an artist comes in, there's a, it's a moment, it's an acknowledgement that we want to do things differently, but in order to do that thing differently, we have to look more carefully at ourselves. And that's, that's, I think the moment where the artist is so critical. Um, and I think, you know, kind of one of the key responsibilities is, you know, because the municipal environment is different, um, you know, it's really reflecting on that, um, I want to say kind of that public service ethos. Um, you know, it, it's like the reason I'm in public service is, you know, I want to serve the public. And just, you know, kind of understanding that there is the municipality, like the government, and as well as the community and, and who it's for, and, and really, you know, listening and, um, you know, and, and hearing from, from our community as well as from the municipality. And I, I think that's, yeah, what I would say on that. Well, that's my mantra. All we have is each other. So mm -hmm. thank you both. I'm going to invite Rebecca and Jan to join us again to, to close us off. Jan? Um, thank you, Michelle, for uh, facilitating a really dynamic conversation. And thank you, Shirley and Carolyn, for your exceptional insights into the programs uh, that you both run, um, the complexities of bringing artists into the bureaucratic structures, the balancing of constraints and opportunities, the role of translator, um, Shirley, you mentioned, and I, that really resonated with me, um, and hearing the real need for trust and collaboration across various disciplines. These are things that take time and energy, and so they need full buy-in on both sides. And it's been really interesting to hear um, you both talk about how that is how that is fostered. And Carolyn, I have to say, it's been particularly wonderful to hear a scientist speaking with such enthusiasm about um, having an artist involved in your work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the kind of systems change that, that seems to have happened there. Uh, we had a comment from Calgary-based artists, Caitlin Brown and Wayne Garrett, who said one of the most amazing aspects of artists working embedded in a civic entity is the beautiful opportunities for, to collaborate with other subject matter experts. and, and um, that's really come to light in this conversation. So the re results are remar remarkable. Um, I often talk about public art as the most human element of, of the built city, but what amazing things happen when that interest in asking questions and telling those stories is actually happening within the city building structure itself. So thank you all for this conversation today. Thank you to all of our uh, listeners and audience for joining us. And before I hand um, the, the mic over to Yan for final remarks, Please remember to mark your calendars for future events starting with next week, November 3rd, 1.30 um, p.m. EST. We have our fourth session, Art and Urban Planning, which will feature a presentation from Ellen Blumenstein, uh, Artistic Director of Imagine the City, Hamburg, Germany, uh, and a conversation moderated by Brenda Webster Tweel uh, from Stantex Urban Places with respondents Parvathi Nampur Thiri, 
uh, who is manager of urban design in the city of Markham, and Richard Fournier, manager of parks and open space development in the city of Markham. So different tone of conversation, I think, will be equally as dynamic. Thank you all. Jan? Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Hope to see you again in the next six sessions. And um, all the sessions, like we mentioned, all the sessions will be recorded and make available online at the Summit website. And you can find the link in the chat box. And the recordings of Ken Lam's keynote and the week two session on collaborative process are both available now. And everyone who signs up um, for our live sessions will also receive our biweekly newsletters in which you will find all Summit related updates and including the questions and we were not able, we didn't have time to answer and during the um, um, live session and a series of uh, commissioned interviews on the topics of uh, public art master plans, development and planning tools, public art on campus and public art in transit. And uh, that's it for today's session. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day and goodbye everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Okay, bye. Take care.